السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد so today we meet to discuss a very important matter which all of us need to understand and from the works of one of the greatest scholars amongst the Ummah his name is Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, his Risala that he had written the scholars they say that this is half of the Risala because as we see in the introduction he talks about Sabr and he also talks about Shukr and the Risala that is mentioned here it uh, details the matters of Sabr but if we were to delve uh, into this topic from his students is Ibn al-Qayyim and he's written amazing work on Sabr and Shukr one of the famous uh, books is Uddatul uh, Sabari. This is a very good book by uh, Ibn al-Qayyim and he details many types of sabr from different angles, the levels of sabr and also matters of shukr and also the comparison between scholars which is better over the other sabr or shukr. So inshallah if you get a chance with, to study this book with a scholar then you should do so and benefit from the gems that Ibn al-Qayyim, his student, as mentioned. So we will not go into the details of his biography because it's quite there and alhamdulillah uh, they were uh, the duat who came and did uh, details on his life before. But what we'd mention here is and uh, I'm going to change the tartib here now. Instead of going into the preface of this book and discussing the um, the phases that Ibn, 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 sorry, Ibn Taymiyyah went through, we will take them as inshallah as an application towards the end because there is the fruits of these principles you can see them in his life so we'll try to see how he lived his life based on the principles that he documented for us so this book which is the principle of patience is talking about 20 principles that we need to remind ourselves and we need to uh, keep them in mind whenever we are going through trials and tribulations or even in the matters of uh, peace and prosperity and uh, we will, he has given good examples and he has brought gems out of these principles so inshallah we'll go through them before we begin that we'll look into what uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi he talks about before beginning the principle so we'll go into his words to understand why these principles have been mentioned and to understand the context of these uh, principles that we need to inshallah adhere to okay. issue close, 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 close. is it okay so uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared some good for his believing slaves in every stage of life they are always experiencing some blessing from his lord from their lord whether they can encounter what they like or dislike and Allah has made his judgments and decrees which he ordains and makes possible for them like trade by which they profit from or pathways by which they are able to reach him so what is he trying to say the qadr of Allah as Allah has ordained and what he wills for each person throughout his life what 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 comes out of it is for a believer is that it is a tra uh, profitable trade for him so if he goes through it with patience and shukr sabr and shukr then he will earn the reward of it and he will be able to reach the position or the status which Allah wants him to reach his manzila he will he, his darajat would increase and he will reach his destination just as it is affirmed in the sahih from the believers imam and master prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whose name when every nation will be called by their leaders on the day of standing will be referred to when calling them the hadith goes amazing is the affair of the believer indeed all of his affairs are good and that is not for anyone but the believer. If good befalls him, he is grateful. And so it is good for him. And if harm befalls him, he is patient. And so it is good for him. 
This is the hadith of a uh, Muslim. And it's a famous hadith which talks about uh, the decree of Allah and how to go through it, how the believer takes it by saying Alhamdulillah in all the situation. This hadith is general and incorporates all of Allah's decrees for his believing slave and indicates that they are something good if a slave is patient, okay, when the decree is what is disliked. So this is one of the traits that the slave, if something that is decreed is disliked, he's patient over it. And he is grateful when it is what is liked. So if something he is blessed, that he has got some ni'mah, he has been blessed, then he is uh, grateful over it. So he is balancing sabr and shukr in the different states that Allah puts into. In fact, this conce concept falls under the title of faith, just as some of the Salaf mentioned that faith has two halves. One half is patience and the other is gratitude. So iman has two halves. So one half is patience and the other is gratitude. Meaning a, a believer will go through different phases in life and he will be interchanging between these two. And that's the reason why his iman would fluctuate. And in either cases, he is re his reliance, his tawakkil is on Allah and he is patient when he is tested and he is grateful when he is uh, blessed. And this is based on the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Inna fi la kulli sabbarin shakur. So here in this ayah it means indeed in that are signs for every patient and grateful. This is Surah Ibrahim. So here the patience and gratefulness. Both the traits have been mentioned in this verse. Then he talks about the three types of patience. If the slave of Allah considers the entire religion, he will see that it returns to its entirety, entirety to patience and grateful, gratitude. Sorry, This is because there are three types of patience. What are the three types of patience? The first of it is patience in carrying out the acts of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do what Allah commanded us to do. The second type of patience is patience in refraining from prohibitions. To stay away from the haram. And the third type of patience is the patience which one is afflicted by, which is without choice, what happens to him. And then the Shaykh divides this into further two types, we'll see that now. So patience in carrying out the acts of obedience to Allah, the slave of Allah almost does not carry out the order except after demonstrating some kind of patience, perseverance and struggle against his inner and open enemy. So basically when you are performing the acts of obedience, there are two challenges that you face. That is one which is from your inside, is your nafs, and the other is the Satan. So these two are obstacles for you to perform your acts of obedience, whether they are from the wajibah to the sunan, to the nawafil, whatever it might be. As you want to come closer to Allah, you'll find that there will be some kind of resistance uh, through this. Thus his performance of obligatory duties and recommended ones are according to his patience. So he has to be patient while doing the obligations. Some days will be, his iman will be high, some days his iman will be low and the, the reasons could be inner self, his nafs or it could be the whispers of shaitan. So this is one of the types. The second type is patience and refraining from the prohibitions. Certainly the soul and its inclinations, Satan's allurement and bad company are all invite and encourage one to sins. So not only does the whisper, the company that we keep, if they are not good company, then we will be afflicted by the bad company and we will be progressing towards the sins. Therefore, by the strength of one's patience, again, you need patience to stay away from evil and the whispers of shaitan and bad company. One is able to leave them. Some of the Salaf, they said, good actions are carried out by both the good doer and the evil doer. So, a good deed can be done by both. Uh, a person who does good and the person who does evil. But no one is able to leave sins except the truthful one. So leaving sins is uh, a trait of Iman. That if you are really true to Allah and the deen of Allah, then you will try your best to leave that which Allah is angered by and that which upsets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third type is patience with what one is afflicted by, which is without choice. The Shaykh now he says, the Shaykh al-Islam, he says, this is of two types. The first type is a type which the creation has no control over. A type which is, 
having no bearing on he doesn't have any control over and the second type is the type which reaches him at the hand of the people with respect to his wealth his honor and his self so we'll delve into this and see what sheikh al islam is talking about so the type which the creation does not have control over this is such as sickness if somebody is falling ill or any kind of affliction which allah has sent any afflictions any calamity that comes upon them as you see in the world the natural disasters whatever might happen and it could be matters of the life any afflictions related to the matters of the life which he did not uh, he did not uh, do it by his own it came to him as life progressed such matters facilitate one's patience as he is able to witness in them the decree of allah and fate and that people have no ability to alter them so he accepts it what happened he accepts it he is falling sick he accepts it can he do anything about it he can't do he, can he ward away evil he cannot ward away his evil if a calamity comes to him a natural disaster happens in his area and he is affected by him or any other issues at work at life in in his relationship with his family some calamity that happens taking away of his loved one or the uh, cases where they have a child and he is deformed and allah test him through that child so all of this is not in his hands this he accepts the qadar of allah he accepts the will of allah thereby a slave of allah bears patiently whether he is compelled or given choice so even if the kuffar they are going through this they are forced to be patient whereas the believer when he goes through it he accepts it he goes to the level of rida and then he excels to the level of uh, the level of muhabba so he accepts it his heart is tranquil with it he is happy about it and then he loves it because he knows that allah is going to give him the rewards for what he is so these are the levels of the servants of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if allah opens the slave's heart to the door of contemplation over the benefits of the affliction and all that is contained of favors and grace he turns from being patient to being grateful as we saw so when he looks at the calamity and when he looks at what went through and he knows that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to uh, test him and raise his ranks bless him give him rewards and whatever as we see in the principles also the shaykh al islam he has mentioned then he will not only be patient he will be grateful so his state changes from sabr to shukr on a calamity he is shakir on a calamity he is shakir subhanallah and he is pleased with it this is where he is having uh, rida in in truth the affliction transforms into a blessing and both his heart and tongue continues to call out my lord help me to remember you thank you and worship you well and this is the dua which we say after prayers which is allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik so this is his words when he is progressing from patience to uh gratitude this condition is either strengthened or weakened in according to the strength and weakness of one's love for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you find the slaves of allah in different levels and may allah increase our love for him and you will find that the slave of allah uh, he bears it with patience and he bears it with uh, with shukr and that is only because of the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In fact we often find this is a reality of life as the poet said addressing his beloved who harmed him in some way though it grieves me that you defamed me with evil it pleased me to know that i crossed your mind i see so what about uh, us and our relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second type is the type which reaches him at the hands of the people with respect to his wealth honor and self this type is very difficult to bear with patience because the soul feels the pain it is very difficult because the soul feels the pain if you lost the money that you were accumulating if you lost the uh, the relationship that you had with your wife or your spouse uh, this hurts you it dislikes being it, it dislikes being overpowered and so it seeks revenge so if there is something which happens to him where uh, where his ego is hurt where uh, matters are related to his heart where he feels that he was brought uh, down in front of people then he would surely want to get his right back and take revenge 
This is the nature of the soul. No one is able to bear this type of affliction with patience except the prophets and the truthful. They, these are the two class of people who can bear this, pa this, patience, uh, this pain with patience. So, so the prophets, can we become prophets? We can't. The prophets, the last of the prophet is the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But the Siddiqun, the truthful, we may be, uh, we may be able to be part of them, insha'Allah. When our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was harmed, he would say, may Allah have mercy on Musa. He was afflicted with greater harms than this, but bore it with patience. This is recorded in Bukhari and Muslim. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed the people that one of the past prophets was beaten by his people and said, oh Allah, forgive my people for indeed they know not. This is again Bukhari and Muslim. And it happened to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also that he had said these words. It has further been reported from the Prophet ﷺ that something similar happened to him at the hands of the people and he said a supplication like this. So, so in this dua, O oh Allah forgive my people for indeed they know not. Okay? There are three matters that we need to look at. There are three matters that we need to look at. What are those three matters? The first is to pardon the wrongdoers not to take revenge, not to retaliate, and to pardon the wrongdoers. And the second is, not just pardoning him, to seek forgiveness for them. To seek forgiveness for them. And this is the dua that you are making. May Allah forgive them. And the third is to let go of what happened to you, which is excusing them for their ignorance. That is giving excuse to them that they might have done because of this reason or maybe they were not knowledgeable so that way you are not holding on to the grudge and not getting into the aspects uh, the ill aspects of the heart so these are three things i repeat again pardoning them seeking forgiveness for them so you pardon them ask allah to forgive them and let go of the matter that is to excuse them for their ignorance these are the three matters combined in this supplication O oh Allah, forgive my people, for indeed they know not. So what is the end result of this type of patience? What is the end result of the second type of patience? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, the end result of this type of patience is victory. He is successful. He is honored. He gets happiness. He is in safe, safety. He is at peace. And Allah causes power. Uh, he gives him power. Okay, why? Because this is in the cause of Allah. He does it for the sake of Allah. In addition to these, to these, uh, to the increase in one's love for Him, so Allah not only gives this, Allah increases in love for Him. And on top of that, so these are all the samarat of being patient. And on top of that, the people love Him. People love Him. And the last is that he is increased in knowledge. His ilm increases. So what are they? He is victorious. He receives honor. He is happy about it. His heart is content. He is safe. He is at peace. He receives power. Allah will raise his positions in the cause of Allah. And Allah, the love for Allah, uh, he, uh, love of Allah will be increased for him. And the love of the people will also be given to him. People will love him. And last, he will increase in knowledge. And he says, accordingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَجْعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ And we made from among them leaders guiding by our command when they were patient and when they were certain of our signs. So this ayah, is talking about giving power and leadership to them. So, uh, seeking leadership, the first step of seeking le leadership is what? To be patient. To be patient in the uh, way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that doesn't mean that you uh, you want to just be patient and everyone seeking leadership. This is, this is something which Allah gives. And He only gives to His truthful slaves. So, there are two aspects now which he talks about. He talks about attaining leadership in the religion. Attaining leadership in the religion where he becomes a scholar of the deen or he takes a position in the deen. There are two aspects. 
The first aspect is patience, as we saw. And the second is certainty, yaqeen, sabr and yaqeen. If one was to add to this patience, the strength of yaqeen and iman, certainty and faith, he would advance through the levels of happiness by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for that, he quotes the ayah of Surah Al-Hadid. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ That is the grace of Allah bestowed on whom he wills. And Allah is the owner of tremendous grace. And then he quotes another verse, which is from Surah Al-Fusilat. إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَطِيبٌ And thereupon the one whom between you and him is enmity will become as though he was a devoted friend. But none is granted it except those who are patient and none is granted it except one having tremendous portion. So with this he finishes the introduction. So now we have not started the principles till now. But you come to know the merits of why you need to study these principles. And how we will go back to them constantly and try to apply in our lives. Because it's easy to read and understand and attend lectures. It's very difficult to apply them in our lives. Especially when you are in a state of calamity, you are in a state of rage, and whatever uh, ill characters that we might go through in during the time when patience is required. So, he says that there are many factors that aid the slave of Allah in practicing patience. And he uh, talks about 20 of them. So the first of them is to believe in the qadr of Allah, the will of Allah. And by believing in the qadr of Allah, that it is from the qadr of Allah, whatever happens, it will become easy for him. This pain, this difficulty will become easy for him because his heart will be at rest. He will not be complaining. And many aspects. We'll look into this, inshallah. This is the first one is that a yashhada, that is to attest, that one attests to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the slaves' actions, their movements, their stationary positions, and their wishes. So, everything related to the abd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of it. Not only his body, his matters, his actions, his movements, his stationary positions, and his wishes and desires. Whatever Allah wills, is. And whatever He wills not, cannot be. So this is the principle here. That when we believe that if Allah wills something for you, it will happen. And we, will that Allah, we, we believe that Allah, if He does not will, it will not happen. So this is the base of believing in Qadr. Okay? No atom in the world, be it in the heavens or the earth, moves except by the permission of Allah and the will of Allah. So this is the base. Thus, the slaves are like instruments, okay? Yet, they have free will, as we discussed in the uh, detailed in our class of uh, Arbaim and Nawawiyah. So, they have free wills, but they are instruments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, look forward, uh, look forward to the one who empowered them over you. So, now, if someone is overpowering you, this calamity is upon you. Okay, somebody is wronging you. This calamity is upon you. So, naturally our inclination will be towards whom? Towards the problem and the one who is creating the problem, right? What true belief in Qadr is, Al-Qadr wal Qadr is, that you understand that this problem that is happening to me happened only because Allah willed it. This is the first stage. To, to go back to the belief. This is where Everywhere you find the sifat of the sabr and shukr related to believers. And belief in qadr, the pillar of uh, qadr wal qadr, is one of the pillars of iman. So you start, he, the shaykh, he starts, shaykh al-islam, he starts with belief in qadr. Which is not there with the disbelievers. They do not believe in this. They have their own beliefs and they are devoid of this. But the Muslim who believes in Allah... He is blessed with this understanding of Al-Qadr wal-Qadr. 
so look towards the one who empowered them over you and do not look at their actions towards you so if somebody is wronging me i might be inclined to look at that action to retaliate back to him but if i have this that uh, this thought that allah ordained this to happen to me now we are not getting into the fake of you know uh, uh, the rights of the one who is wronged and all we are not getting into it. we are just looking at the sifat of qalb and how to become a better human okay uh, so if someone in retaliation harms him out not not without thinking it so there is a difference between him and a mu'min and that comes to this point that you look at the one who caused this incident to happen and not the one who is causing it in front of you so what will happen in this so do not look at the bad actions towards you that is the people it will relieve you from worry grief and sorrow that somebody wronged me and i am constantly thinking about it constantly thinking about it what is it going to do he wronged me and he left maybe i might take revenge with him. even if i take revenge and i constantly think that somebody has wronged me i will always be in a state of worry in state of grief and shaitan loves this shaitan loves that the believer is sad because his actions are the good deeds are reduced he will not do more good deeds he will be confined with the problems of his life so this is what it talks about so this is the first principle that if you have the right belief in qada wal qadar handling a calamity would become easy for you okay handling a calamity would become easy for you because you know deep that this calamity happened by the will of allah if allah did not will it it would not have happened to me and and to talk about this is easy but to put it in practice is difficult may allah make it easy for us so what it means is if i focus on the one who allowed this to happen okay that is allah subhanahu wa taala then it will comfort me through the affliction it will comfort me and i'll i'll go through this phase easily i have to go through this phase this way or that way how i want to go through this phase is my choice this is my choice then he goes to the second point which is to acknowledge your sins in a nutshell it is to acknowledge your sins and once you acknowledge your sins you head towards what to repentance and seeking forgiveness which is tauba and istighfar that the slave of allah attests to his sins and that allah has only allowed them that is his enemies to control over him due to his sin the second factor that he contemplates on first is the, uh, the belief in qadr the second is that he has sinned and he has not fulfilled the rights of allah and because of this the calamity has happened or he is going through this just as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says wa ma asabakum min musibatin fa bima kasabat aydikum wa ya'fu an kathir and whatever of misfortune befalls you it is because of what your hands have earned and he pardons much surah surah ashura shura so this is the dalil that most of the problems that we go through and the afflictions that we go through is because of what we did is our sins our shortcomings shortcomings in fulfilling fulfilling the obligations and the shortcomings in abstaining from the prohibitions and especially the secret deeds may allah protect us when nobody sees and you slip but allah is the one who sees may allah correct our affairs thus when the slave attests that everything which reaches him from dislikable things is caused by sins what's going to happen he busies himself with what repentance and seeking forgiveness instead of busying with the problem why it happened to me why am i being uh, why am i been chosen like this why am i been left this way all those satanic thoughts that come to your mind where you are denying the qadar of allah they will be all what in the way why because you think of your sin okay and because of that you want to repent do more good deeds okay and constantly be in a state of istighfar constantly be in the state of istighfar 
So what, what benefit he gets through this principle is because of this he has been due to this he has been overcome by the people's censure, blame and slander. And when you see a slave effect, affected by the people, okay, when they harm him, but he does not reproach himself and seek forgiveness. Okay? So there is a person who blames him, sorry, who blames himself and seeks forgiveness. But there's another person who is not into this habit. He forgets that he is he is also a sinner. There are things that he should have also done or abstained from. Okay, and he doesn't put his himself to account and he doesn't seek forgiveness. What happens? Then know that this that his calamity is truly a great one. Because he is deluded. He is deluded into looking at the world as creating problems for him. Whereas Allah might be testing him. Allah might be raising his rank through the affliction that he had. Or Allah wants him to repent because Allah loves those who repent. So we don't know what is the, uh, the, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, uh, what Allah wants from us. But being grateful and acknowledging that we are deficient will help us in this dunya and in the akhirah. But if he repents and seeks forgiveness, saying this is because of my sin, it turns out to be a blessing in respect to him. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, radiallahu anhu, he said, uh, a statement which is from the gem of the speech. What did he say? Let a slave not have hope in anyone but his Lord. So his hope should be only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he alone causes good and repels evil. Nor a slave fear anything but his sin. So instead of fearing the tyrant, instead of fearing the, the, the calamity that has come to you or the problems that you, are, you fear your sins. Because whatever happens, whether it is a test or it is because of our sin, Allah is the one who will repel it. So if you acknowledge your sins and go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will deal with whatever problems you are going through. Either he will make you walk through it easily or he will repel it or he might cause something better to happen because of that due to its consequences overpowering him and it is reported from him Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu that and others that no calamity befalls a person except due to sin and it is not lifted except by repentance so no calamity falls uh, except because of a sin and it is not lifted that calamity is not lifted except by repentance. So sins and repentance they go hand in hand. So these are related to my inner self regarding the belief, the qadr and to keep myself in check. Then the Shaykh he goes into the next point is the third one which is knowing that by pardoning someone and having patience through it you will be given the best of the rewards. Knowing that you will be getting reward for this action that you would do as opposed to taking revenge and being uh, retaliating or taking your rights, right? So, what does it mean? That the slave of Allah realizes the fact that the best of the rewards which Allah has promised is for those who pardon and is patient. Those who pardon and are patient, Allah will be giving them the best of the reward. Just as He, the Most High, states, وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّيَةٍ سَيِّيَةٌ مِثْلُهَا فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ The recompense for an evil is an evil like thereof. But whoever forgives and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. Verily, he likes not the oppressors, the polytheist and the wrongdoers. This is again Surah Ashura. Now here, the Shaykh al-Islam, he talks through this verse, three types of people. Mankind is divided into three types. The first is the oppressor, which is clear in the later part of the verse. Why he is an oppressor? Because he takes more than his rights. So he has oppressed. If he was to retaliate and take what was his, then he would not be called an oppressor. The sparing one, the one who takes the value of his right. Whatever he was wrong at, he took his right. And the good doer, the fail al khair, who is he? The one who pardons and leaves, leaves off his rights. And you will find this in the fiqh, when, uh, especially in, uh, in the matters of uh, in fiqh al uh, 
uh, that you, if you are being wronged by a, a person, then you have all the three options. You can take what is your haq, okay, obviously there has to be an oppressor. You can take your haq or you can forgive him or you can forgive him and that would be the best uh, to do. There are tafsil in this but we will not get into the fiqh aspect of it. So there are three types. So when you look at this part, the recompense for an evil is an evil like thereof. This is talking about the sparing one, the one who takes whatever he was wronged about, only related to that. And then the next one is, but whoever forgives and makes reconciliation, this is the good doer. His reward is due from Allah. And the last one is, verily he likes not the oppressors, polytheists and wrongdoers. This is the oppressor who takes more than his right. Allah mentioned the three types in this verse. The first part is directed to the sparing ones, the middle is to the forerunners, that is the good doers, and the end is to the oppressors. Then he brings a, uh, then he brings a hadith, which is recorded in uh, Ibn Abi Hatib, recorded by him, which says, a caller will testify on the day of standing, on the day of judgment, saying, let him rise, whoever's reward is binding upon Allah. That is to recompense him by his will alone. So it will be a, a call will be made that whoever deserves the reward by from Allah for the reason that we so that he was a good doer, right? Then let him rise, and none will step forward except the one who forgave and made reconciliation. Such a big deed this is to forgive and to reconcile hearts. It is not uh, a deed which many of us can do. May Allah correct our affairs and cause us to attain good traits. When he, the slave, sees for himself along with that, that one loses reward due to retaliation and taking one's right in the world, patience and forgiveness becomes easy for him. So this is what he says. When he sees that this will be the status of the person who went through patience, and did not retaliate, then in this life, when he knows this, he will be striving to work towards patience and striving to forgive others. This was the third point. The the third yeah, third one is basically talking about pardoning, okay, and patience. The reward of this is the best of the rewards. And the opposition to that is what? Retaliation and revenge or retaliation in taking one's rights. This is loss of rewards. You will lose deeds by retaliating and uh, asking your right. Because the verse clearly talks about what? The one who was a good doer, his reward is with whom? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the one who got his right in this dunya. Right? So this is what uh, the fourth point was. What I will do is I'll write the summaries of all those points. Inshallah, I'll make a, a small PDF out of it for revision. Inshallah, I'll share with the brothers and then everyone can benefit from it. Inshallah. So in, in a nutshell, then you can always go back to the book or a few lectures and, and, and benefit from it. So the fourth principle he talks about is, as we saw, the reward of the one who is patient. What is the reward? What is the fruit that he'll be getting from this? What is the fruit of forgiveness? It is, the first is, it opens his heart, okay, it opens his heart. So open heartedness towards whom? His fellow brethren. So the slave of Allah realizes the fact that when he forgives and reacts well, it causes him to have open heartedness towards his fellow brethren. So this is the first one, he'll be open hearted, he'll be easy going, people would like to be with him talk to him, approach him. This is because of his sifat of, of pardoning and forgiveness. Second thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will clean his heart. His heart will be cleansed. From what? From treachery and holding grudges. He will not be holding grudges. He will not be treacherous in his nature because of forgiving. Because if you don't forgive and you keep something in your heart, you would always want to give him a payback. So you, will, you are in this state of paying, you know, want to pay him back in this way or the other, or make it even worse. 
to take make his life miserable because you are not letting go of it this grudge it develops and it grows and many many a times this happens between the couples not forget about what happens uh, with the matters of the dunya why did my wife do this why did my husband do that and you keep and grow keep and grow on it and until in, uh, until unless the it comes to a point that you file divorce with each other the reason was what you did not have this character of letting go this character of letting go overlooking would have helped you to not get grudges and if you did not get grudges you would not be uh, bad with each other and you would be you would have been open hearted easy going with each other and this is the best of the relationships that one can be and you would have preserved your marriage and raised your children on the deen because at the end of the day who suffers is the children so if the spouses they understand this they can fix their lives so and they will not be treacherous seeking retaliation or intending evil this is the th- and the third benefit that they get from this is that one obtains the sweetness of pardoning which increases his delight and benefit this is halawat al iman sweetness of the iman you know he will attain the sweetness in his heart in his affairs in his matters and it will reflect in his character it will reflect in his character now how does it come how does this sweetness come into him it could come immediately to him or it could come in the di- distant future this is from the uh, matters where allah would bless him it could happen immediately or it could basically uh, come at a later phase in life or any benefit gained by retaliation and such a person is included in the statement of the most high wallahu yuhibbul muhsinin verily allah loves the good doers the muhsinin so patience and gratefulness leads to ihsan which is the the third daraja which all of us should strive to get and to become a muhsin you need to have uh, sabr and shukr at some level or the other so then he brings an example he brings an example here thus the slave becomes a beloved of allah and his condition becomes like one from whom a dirham is taken that allah afflicted him and took a dirham from him it is dirham back then was of a coin of silver but he compensated with thousands of dinars thousands of dinars of gold coins of gold by which he rejoices in what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon him with the utmost joy possible so what what this means is what allah afflicted him and took away from him allah compensates and gives him in multiples in multiples in this dunya and the akhirah in this dunya and the akhirah so okay. we go to the fifth principle which is now we saw that patience and pardoning best of the rewards we saw the fruits of patience and pardoning now shaykh al islam he talks about the one who takes the revenge and the one who pardons uh, sorry takes the revenge and does not pardon so he says that the one who takes the revenge and he retaliates this will lead to humiliation for him this will lead to humiliation but the one who pardons and forgives allah will honor him it's talking about the honor that allah will bless him with for the one who uh, pardons that the slave of allah acknowledges that nobody ever retaliates for himself so he is not retaliating for the deen he is not uh, uh, he is not worried about the deen or the uh, the matters of re- the religion basically but he is based on his himself uh, on his ego or whatever matter that happened to him he retaliates so the sheikh he says that ever nobody retaliates for himself except that it causes within him humiliation he will be humiliated but when he pardons allah subhanahu wa taala he honors him so the one who forgives allah will give him honor and the one who retaliates allah will take his honor away and he will humiliate this is included in what the truthful and the trusted one 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed when he said, "Allah does not increase a slave for his actions of pardoning except in honor." This is a hadith of Sahih Muslim. Except in honor. So, if you pardon, Allah will increase you in honor. Know that you will be increased in honor. Whether people recognize that or not, but with Allah, you will be attaining honor because it's a lofty trait. Thus, the honor which one achieves by pardoning is more beloved to him and beneficial than the honor that he achieves uh, that he achieves by retaliating. So, one, it does not mean that if somebody, because if you look at the Sira back then, the, the tribes they used to fight each other. They would re take revenge with each other, right? So they would feel that they have done something for their tribe by taking the uh, reta uh, the, the retaliation or revenge basically and they, they would feel honor because now they have lived up for their tribe and when Islam came all these things were, uh, were abolished and, and the Prophet ﷺ, he raised the ranks of the companions and he made them understand uh, what is more honor so from this basically and from this what we know is that the honor that a person receives when he is retaliating this is nothing compared to the honor which he receives when uh, he pardons. And wallahi this is seen that a person who forgives, he will be respected by the people. He, Allah will cause people to have this, which he never thought uh, that people would uh, respect him and honor him. And uh, this, is, uh, this is because of pardoning and letting go. Pardoning and letting go. For indeed this type which involves retaliation is honor outwardly, zahiran. It's an honor outwardly, but inwardly it is shame. In his badin, it, it is shame. He will, if his conscience is awake, he will know that what he did is wrong. He will not be happy with what he did. He might justify it due to whatever reasons in this dunya he can justify. But inside he will be, he knows that he did something which he should not have done. But pardoning may be humiliating inwardly, okay? But it is also uh, maybe humiliating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, what he's saying is the pardoning may be humiliating inwardly. When you are actually forgiving someone, it is not uh, easy for you. You are going through difficulties in this because this is a, a lofty, a lofty sifa. It's a lofty trait. To when you have the power to punish someone, when you have the power to take your rights. And then you are forgiving that and you are you're, you're forgetting that and you are actually pardoning. So this needs courage. So it might be humiliating at that time. There might be people who might come and say, why you did not do this? Why you, you had the right? You could have done whatever. So in, in, he might feel the, that he is humiliated in that moment basically. But in reality, his, he will be blessed with honor inwardly as well as outwardly. Because he will know that his conscience will say that what you did is the right thing. People will not understand maybe. But what you did is the right thing. And when Allah will make people understand, he will, his zahir will also become honorable. So this is what it talks about. This is uh, talking about honor from Allah. This is again a reward and humiliation for the one who takes revenge. And the sixth principle. And it is from the Greatest benefits the slave of Allah realizes that the recompense is in accordance to uh, in accordance with its like in al jaza min jinsil amal. So, whoever pardons and forgives people, he will be getting the jaza for it. Who will pardon him? Allah subhanahu wa taala will pardon him. So if he part, this is another point that yes, Allah will honor you. Maybe you will not understand that you will be getting an honor. But for sure you know that if you pardon for the sake of Allah, if you forgive someone for the sake of Allah, then for sure you know that Allah loves those and he will also forgive you. He will also forgive you. As you know the incident of Aisha anha, where one of the companions, he said bad about Aisha anha, and Abu Bakr Siddiq, he used to take care of his nakha and then he stopped it and the verse came that don't you want to be forgiven and then he started resumed it again so his daughter is being blamed in a very bad manner right 
and he is asked to forgive. And the reward is with whom? The reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will see some examples in this inshallah. So, what the recompense is in accordance with its like means what? That he himself is a sinner and an oppressor and that whoever pardons people, Allah pardons him. So, realizing that, uh, going back to the second principle, that he has sinned. Right? He has sins. So, that led to what? Repentance and second principle, repentance and forgiveness. But here, it is desiring forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There your actions to seek forgiveness. This principle talks about that if you did this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then know that Allah will forgive you. Allah will forgive you and Allah will pardon you. Thus, when he realizes that his pardoning, his excusing and his behaving well with them, despite their ill treatment to him, is a cause of Allah recompensing him with the likes of his actions by forgiving him, pardoning him and doing good to him despite his, despite his sins. And in addition to this, pardoning and being patient, being patient is made, into him, made, made easy for him. So, he knows that he is a sinner and he has pardoned someone and he has excused them. He is letting go of the issue. He is forgetting it also. And not only that, he is behaving well with them. Right? And they are not behaving well with him. And he knows that the reward for this is Allah will forgive him. So he will also get another benefit. What is it? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in addition will make the <coughs> pardoning that he is doing to people and pa being patient while he is doing it easy for him. This action itself Allah will make easy. You might think, okay, I mean, I am not such a uh, heavy, uh, lofty, I am not having such a lofty character to pardon people. You might think this way. But Allah is saying, don't think this way. If you take the initiative in this direction, Allah will make it easy for you, even if it is difficult for you. So this is a, the additional benefit that he gets. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, and this benefit suffices the intelligent ones. وَيَكْفِي الْعَاقِلْ هَذِهِ الْفَائِدَةِ It is sufficient for the intelligent one that this benefit of making, pardoning, uh, pardoning uh, someone is made easy for him. And while he is doing this, and the greater reward is that Allah will pardon him. So this is the sixth principle. He delves into the seventh principle, which he talks about the negative aspect of retaliation and uh, reciprocation. He says there are three things that a person loses when he actually retaliates and he reciprocates the harm that was done to him. What is it? The fun, uh, first thing is that his time will be wasted in this, these matters. The time will be wasted in these matters. The second is what? His heart will be divided. He'll, his heart will not be settled. He will be unsettled heart. And the benefits will be lost. What benefits will be lost? He talks about these three points when you go in the direction of retaliation. That the slave of Allah knows that when he busies himself with retaliation and reciprocation, that is, reciprocation is what? To give exact in return. His time is wasted. His heart is divided and he loses the benefits which are not possible to make up for. And perhaps this is harder upon him than the calamity which reached him due to them. So what is it? To lose an opportunity to do good. To waste your time and forget your priorities. Because of retaliation and thinking I am going to give him back this way. Or I am going to retaliate in this way. I will make his life miserable or her life miserable. These will de uh, devoid him from the good that he could have done in those days or years or months, whatever that he is busy with. So, thus, if he pardons and excuses, his heart and body are free to achieve the benefits which are more important to him than retaliation. So, he will be, you, he will be forgiving the matter, he will be forgetting the matter and he will busy himself in doing good. Yeah? Anything? Question? Okay, fine, let's 
So we have two more points. If you can give me that much time, inshallah. So the eighth principle is taking his rights is only for himself and his revenge. So if somebody takes his right, he is taking revenge and he is taking it for himself. Whereas if he lets go, he is doing it for the sake of Allah. This is basically what it talks about. That the slave of Allah retaliates and his taking his right and his standing up for it is merely for himself and for, for his revenge. But indeed the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would never take revenge for himself. The best of the creation never did this. He never got angry. He never took revenge for himself. But he did that when the boundaries of Allah were crossed. He did this. He took revenge. He, he retaliated when the boundaries of Allah were passed. So, considering he was the best of the creation and the most noble of them with Allah, he did not take revenge for himself, even though harming him was a futile attempt to harm Allah. So, people wanted to harm the Prophet ﷺ, thinking that harming, they are harming Allah and his deen. And it is connected to the rights of the religion, Allah and his deen. And his self was the noblest and he is the best of the creation, the most pure, the most righteous and furthest away from any ill characters or dispraised characters. And the most closest to the beautiful characters. So meaning he had the right to take revenge. Yet despite this he did not take revenge. So what this point uh, uh, brings to. Therefore how can any of us take revenge for ourselves while knowing that we have faults and we have evils from, from us, within us. In fact the man who knows his worth does not consider himself worthy of taking revenge. So this is the point that they are talking about. And then he delves into the ninth principle. Ninth principle is uh, a bit detailed. So, uh, do we have time? Or you want to take it some other time? Yeah, we can do that. Because this needs a little explanation. Tenth is easy. Tenth will be fine. So, inshallah, we'll suffice with these eight, inshallah, today. And if uh, there is another meeting, with you guys so we might continue this book and I accept this from us and any shortcomings in this is from me and shaitan and all the good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa akhiru da'awana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen subhanakallahu wa bihamdulillah ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah